Great. Uh, thank you, Jacob. It's a pleasure to be here. I think my seventh uh, A-Cure, and they get better and better every year. These are my disclosures, but I do have one more disclosure, uh, and that is that I believe the right ventricle is the most important ventricle, and I love talking about it. So when Jerry said you have an hour and 20 minutes to talk about the right ventricle, I was very excited, and he said, no, 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 you have 20 minutes, so we'll, we'll do the best I can. <clears throat> Uh, so Hap showed uh, the slide from our New England Journal Review earlier this year, and I think he said it's very complicated. And it is, but when we really break it down uh, into some basic principles, it can really help create a framework for how we're going to assess and then therefore treat right heart failure. So we have, of course, four main determinants of RV uh, function, preload, afterload, contractility, and lucitropy or active relaxation. And it's important to realize that these determinants all impact one another. For example, if we have excessive afterload, this can lead to RV dilatation, tricuspid regurgitation that will actually then increase our preload. If we have a reduction in contractility, again, we can get RV dilatation causing increases in preload. Reduced lucitropy can cause ventricular interdependence impacting contractility. And so, what, unfortunately, what can happen is this uh, circle of death, as it's called, and the ultimate end is development of right ventricular failure. So with that context in mind, let's talk about how we assess the right ventricle. And we have great imaging modalities to do that, right? We have echocardiography, we have MRI, we have simple metrics on echo, like TAPSI, trans, uh, <clears throat> tricuspid annular uh, plane systolic excursion. And we know that this is prognostic in patients with heart failure. We can look at fractional area change. And then we have MRI, which is probably our best uh, uh, surrogate for structure and function of the heart. And all of these discriminate survivors from non-survivors uh, in patients uh, with heart failure. And so they work really well when the RV is very dysfunctional. But I think often what's most important is to assess the RV when it's mildly dysfunction or dysfunctional or borderline dysfunctional or when the patients have hidden right ventricular failure. So what complicates that assessment? Well, we know, of course, that the RV is very afterload sensitive. This has been alluded to already this morning. Our very classic experiment shown at, or, uh, shown at every RV talk by Abel and Waldison showing that in the acute setting, right, RV uh, uh, stroke volume declines significantly with increases in mean pulmonary artery pressure, just 15 millimeters of mercury, 30% reduction in RV stroke volume. Compare that to the LV, 40 millimeters increase in systolic blood pressure, uh, really only a slight decline, decline in LV stroke volume. But I think what's less appreciated is that the RV remains afterload sensitive even in the chronic setting. So one of my favorite studies here by Anna, Anna Hemnes at Vanderbilt looked at hemodynamics before and after nitric oxide administration in patients with vasoreactive pulmonary hypertension. As you would expect by definition, pulmonary vascular resistance fell in this group after nitric oxide, and this was met by a predictable increase in stroke volume. So it really speaks to the idea of afterload sensitivity, and many of our markers of how we assess the right ventricle, which depends on stroke volume, are indeed afterload sensitive. So how did we get around that? And of course, it would not be an A-cure talk if we didn't show at least a pressure volume loop. Uh, and of, of course, this is the gold standard for assessing RV function uh, and, and to assess RVPA coupling. We've used these techniques to try to understand differences in subtypes of pulmonary hypertension. Here showing that patients with scleroderma-related pulmonary hypertension have decreased intrinsic contractility compared to idiopathic pulmonary hypertension patients, uh, and, and that is uh, even despite no differences in conventional imaging or hemodynamics between the two groups. We've shown that these multi-beat pressure volume loops can predict uh, time to clinical worsening in pulmonary hypertension, and we've even shown differences in uh, gender uh, in terms of contractility, perhaps explaining why women tend to do better with the development of pulmonary hypertension than men. But this can be a little bit complicated, right? We have to reduce preload. And so there are less invasive ways to do this, and the so-called single B estimate is one of those. And this is based on the principle that we could estimate a maximal pressure that the RV could generate if it was ejecting into infinite load, for example, if you tied off the pulmonary artery. And so to estimate this, we can fit a sine wave to the isovolumic portions of the RV pressure tracing, and this P max then gets paired with end diastolic volume. Our other point is our end systolic volume and end systolic pressure, and the slope of that line is our measure of contractility. 
And in this uh, study of normotensive dogs, you can see there's a relatively uh, good correlation between the uh, predicted Pmax and the observed Pmax when they actually tied off the pulmonary artery of the dogs. Uh, it appears uh, for the most part that these single beat estimates are good surrogates for multi-beat measures. This is work from uh, uh, Coder Tello and Manuel Richter and Giesen. And you can see that there's a good correlation there between the multi-beat and single beat approaches. But I will say in someone who's done a lot of these that it's very highly dependent on which points you select in those isovolumic phases. And so to use this clinically, we really need an automated approach. And so we recently uh, worked with Rebecca Vanderpool, who's at Ohio State, uh, and we used an automatic program to derive single beat measures of contractility to compare contractile generation before and after LVAD implantation and various approaches to LVAD impl uh, implantation. So you can see here the patients who had an LVAD implant, this is durable LVAD implant, via sternotomy approach had a significant decrease in their contractility, where patients who had a less invasive approach with a thoracotomy, actually they, they showed preservation of contractility with that implant. Well, what about just a simple right heart catheterization? Which of our hemodynamic variables it correlates best with true right heart uh, function? This is work from Imran Aslam and Stephen Sue, where they actually took a, a single myocytes, skinned them, put them on a contractile apparatus, and exposed those uh, myocytes to different levels of calcium to create force, force tension curves. And then they looked to see which of these hem hemodynamic uh, parameters correlated best with myocyte contractility. What they found was that it was the pulmonary artery pulsatility index, or pulmonary pulse pressure divided by right atrial pressure, or PAPI. It was our best hemodynamic predictor of contract, or correlated best with RV contractility in this study, better than the RA pressure to wedge ratio, better than right ventricular stroke work index. What other less invasive surrogates do we have to assess the RV? One that we talk about a lot is the TAPSI to PAPSI ratio. We know this is highly prognostic in patients with, with heart failure. Dr. Burkhoff has shown us it can be helpful when we're assessing the need for a tricuspid valve intervention in patients with heart failure. And you can see uh, in this study by, by Tello, there's at least a moderate correlation between the TAPSI-PAPSI ratio uh, and RVPA coupling. It's not a perfect measure, of course. We know that TAPSI is load dependent, so to some extent we're double, double correcting for load, but it's still a reasonable surrogate. Probably the best surrogate we have uh, is RV strain. Now, I want everybody in this room to remember, of course, that strain is not a measure of contractility. In fact, it is very after load dependent. Shown here, no correlation between uh, intrinsic RV contractility and strain. But again, in the study by Tello, we do see a good, a, at least a reasonable correlation between single beat measures of, of coupling uh, and global longitudinal strain of the right ventricle. Well, what's on the horizon? And I would submit to you one of the things that I just described to you is a bunch of measures of right ventricular function at rest. But perhaps we need to assess the RV uh, during a provocation to better assess that. And so one of the ideas is, uh, should we be looking at RV reserve? So this is a study of a piglet model of pulmonary hypertension where they measured pressure volume loops, and then they gave those pigs dobutamine to look at changes in stroke volume index. You can see the black bar there, the rabbits with the most severe uncoupling uh, had the least increase in stroke volume index with dobutamine, where the rabbits that had preserved coupling had the most significant increase in stroke volume index. And you can see there's a relatively linear relationship between stroke volume index reserve and resting RVPA coupling. We have exercised our patients with pulmonary hypertension and found a similar scenario here. This is uh, exercise RV ejection fraction from conductance catheters, but this can be done with exercise MRI as well. And we found an uh, exercise RV ejection fraction was the best predictor of resting um, uh, RVPA uncoupling defined by a ratio of less than one. We also found that exercise RV ejection fraction was a strong predictor of time to clinical worsening in patients with pulmonary hypertension. We also can stress the RV a different way, and that's through pharmacologic means. This is a study that I actually presented last year at ACURE, where we pharmacologically unload the left ventricle with nitroprusside and look at the response of the RV to predict which patients would develop RV failure after left ventricular assist device. And what we found in this study was that the peak stroke volume index during nitroprusside infusion was the best predictor of ultimately those who required uh, who, required, who, who developed right ventricular failure, whereas our resting measures uh, were not as predictive. 
Dr. Bimaraj and his group at Methodist have shown that we can also use a similar approach uh, by uh, mechanically unloading the LV with an Impella device. Here they found the individuals that ultimately did not develop right heart failure after an LVAD had significant decreases in their right atrial pressure, their wedge pressure, significant increases in their pulmonary artery pulsatility index. Compare that to those who did develop right heart failure, and you can see really no significant changes with mechanically unloading the LV. So preliminary data, but it, it suggests that this may be helpful to predict which patients will develop right heart failure. Well, so we talked about exercise, we talked about pharmacologic stressors, but I would submit to you that actually all of us right now in this room are stressing our right ventricles. So when we inspire, we're actually volume loading our right ventricle by about 50 milliliters, uh, 50 milliliters during inspiration. And so can we leverage that when we do a right heart catheterization to determine an at-risk ventricle? So this was a really nice study done by Barbara Lafarge from UNC. They took patients who had pulmonary hypertension and looked at the waveforms, and in spe specifically the right atrial pressure waveform. So this is a healthy individual. You can see there's lots of respiratory variation in both the right atrial pressure and the wedge pressure. But there's another phenotype of patients that lack respiratory variability in that right atrial pressure tracing. So that when they inspire, pressure is not falling like it should, suggesting these individuals have right ventricular dysfunction. And in their hands, they found that the lack of respiratory variation predicted heart failure hospitalization at one year, and it was a strong t trend towards an increase in mortality. And you might be surprised to know that there was actually no difference in the right atrial pressures between these two groups. So perhaps a very sensitive and simple way to assess uh, a right ventricle that's at risk. So with that in mind, let's focus the last few minutes uh, talking about treatment. And of course, it's not so easy. But if we remember our construct and our determinants of, of, of RV function, uh, it's, it's a useful way to, uh, to think about this. So you heard from Dr. Farber earlier, preload optimization is really, really important, right? And that's commonly done through diuretics. It can be done through ultrafiltration. Perhaps, as Dr. Youssef uh, showed us, that it can be done through the precardio device in the future. But we know, of course, it's very important to optimize preload in part because uh, as we have uh, increasing RV volumes, the septum becomes flattened. The RV septum is the lion's share of right ventricular function. And so as that ventricular, uh, that uh, septum is flattened, the RV becomes uh, more dysfunctional. And so we want to normalize RV preload and normalize that septum. We also know that a volume-loaded right ventricle actually has less RV reserve. So in this study by Zabo, you can see changes in contractility was depressed when given uh, inotropic stimulation in the volume-loaded right ventricles. And so this has implications for your patients uh, in the ICU when they need inotropes. They're not going to respond as well if they're volume uh, overloaded. So perhaps, again, going back to that precardio device, if we can normalize their preload, then all of our other uh, uh, ways to optimize RV function uh, will be better. So reduction in afterload, this is a complicated one, right? So we, there are simple things that we can do. We can maintain oxygenation, avoiding that hypoxic vasoconstriction that increases RV afterload. We can avoid hypercapnia. We can reduce atelectasis in patients who are ventilated. But most of the ways that we reduce RV afterload is not effective in left heart disease, right? So all of these different ways, the endothelial receptor antagonists, the uh, process cyclin analogs, the phosphodesterase inhibitors, all of those are really studied and proven in pulmonary arterial hypertension in not in left heart disease where most of our patients uh, have issues with right ventricular dysfunction. And again, uh, this, when we've studied these therapies in left heart disease, for the most part, it's been uh, disappointing, if not even harmful in a couple of studies like CIVAC and Melody, where we saw increases in fluid retention uh, with these therapies. So how do we reduce RV afterload uh, in patients with left heart failure? Well, it's complicated, but one of the things that we can actually do is it goes back again to optimizing preload, but also now preload of the LV. So we know that as left atrial pressure increases, this results in stiffening of the, of the pulmonary vessels. It actually means that compliance is lower for any given resistance. And then we know when we normalize preload, when we normalize that left atrial pressure, right, we see not only a reduction in PVR, but also an increase of compliance. And so we will reduce pulsatile and resistive loading to the RV just by normalizing LV preload. 
We can increase contractility, of course. The most common way, uh, at least historically, we've done this is through uh, inotropic stimulation like beta agonists or phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors. This is a very classic study by Detalia and colleagues in acute ischemic RV failure. And you can see here that in uh, patients receiving dobutamine, significant increases in cardiac index. There was a question brought up by George earlier that talked about volume loading these patients. And the reason that volume loading works in some individuals is because in the setting of a, an MI, you have a vasodilatory state and your RV preload is not sufficient. But you can see in this study here when your CVP was 11, absolutely no benefit to volume loading those individuals. So yes, you can volume load those individuals, uh, but only if they're preload deficient. Once they're tanked up, you're not going to cause, you're not going to have help them and you potentially could actually hurt them. I do want to mention the importance of optimizing LV contractility because we know that the RV depends on the LV for a significant portion of its function. In this study, you can see uh, when we unload the LV, it actually results in a decrease in LV contractility and therefore a decrease in RV contractility. So if we over uh, preload reduce somebody with an impeller device, for example, this can lead to a decrement in our RV function. We also know that decreasing LV afterload too much can be a bad thing, right? So in this study, they actually did aortic banding of patients. With aortic ba banding, we get an increase in LV afterload. We see a rise in LV contractility, and this therefore increases RV contractility. So the cor correlate of that, if you are hypotensive, LV contractility is going to decline, and your RV contractility is going to decline. So we have to support the systemic blood pressure in our patients with RV dysfunction uh, for this reason and also for issues of coronary perfusion. And then finally, uh, there's a lot, and we discussed a lot in this meeting about bypassing the need for inotropes, right? We know inotropes increase oxygen consumption. This may be harmful, particularly in patients who have an acute MI. And so there are, of course, temporary uh, MCS devices like the Impella RP. There's ECMO and different configurations that we've heard a lot about uh, that can be useful in patients with left heart disease. They're still not well studied in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, but perhaps that's coming down the road. Other therapies are on the horizon. This was a, uh, a, a preliminary study that we did in patients with pulmonary hypertension looking at right atrial pacing in patients who are not tachycardic but in right, uh, right heart failure. We saw a typical forced fre frequency response with right, atrial pressure, uh, with right atrial pacing with an increase in contractility at higher heart rates. You can see these individuals um, all had high <coughs> filling pressures uh, at rest, and with pacing, we saw a decrease in the RV filling pressures, perhaps a reduction in pericardial restraint, and this led to an increase in cardiac index. This is very different than if you try to pace somebody with left ventricular failure, where you see an increase in heart rate is offset by a decrease in stroke volume. So perhaps more to come here, particularly in the post-LVAD patients, uh, but at least hypothesis generating. And finally, I'll leave you uh, with this device, which is currently in EFS testing. Uh, this is a, um, a passive balloon device that's put in the pulmonary artery uh, that actually, uh, during systole, it's deflated, during uh, diastole, it inflates, and essentially helps uh, push blood uh, out of the pulmonary uh, artery, uh, increasing compliance, and therefore decreasing uh, RV afterload. So again, a hypothesis generating, but may be helpful in the future. So to summarize, when we're dealing about with the RV, we have to consider, consider the mechanistic determinants of right heart function uh, when both assessing and treating the RV. Assessment of the RV is complicated by afterload sensitiv sensitivity. The single beat approach uh, to pressure volume analysis, if automated, may prove clinically useful. In the meantime, surrogates like PAPI, the TAPSI, the PAPSI ratio, and RV strain may be reasonable. And finally, uh, as we think about treating individuals with uh, RV failure, we want to do, use preload optimization, afterload reduction, increasing contractility, and or support devices, particularly in patients with concomitant left heart disease. Thanks very much for your attention.